Chapter 44 The Rammer River They forced themselves to rise early in the gray pre-dawn hours. Aragon shivered in the cool air. How are we going to transport the elf? She can't ride on Saphir's back much longer without getting sores from her scales. Saphir can't carry her in her claws. It tires her and makes her landings dangerous. A sledge won't work. It would get battered to pieces while we ride. And I don't want the horses slowed by the weight of another person. Murtag considered the matter as he saddled Tornak. If you were to ride, Saphira, we could lash the elf to Snowfire. But we'd have the same problem with sores. I have a solution, said Saphira unexpectedly. Why don't you tie the elf to my belly? I'll be able to move freely and she'll be safer than anywhere else. The only danger will be if soldiers shoot arrows at me, but I can easily fly above those. None of them could come up with a better idea, so they quickly adopted hers. Aragon folded one of the blankets in half lengthwise, secured it around the elf's petite form, then took her to Saphira. Blankets and spare claws were sacrificed to form ropes long enough to encircle Saphira's girth. With these ropes, the elf was tied back first against Saphira's belly, her head between Saphira's front legs. Aragon looked critically at their handiwork. I'm afraid your scales may rub against the ropes. We'll have to check them occasionally for fraying, commented Murtag. Shall we go? Saphira asked, and Aragon repeated the question. Murtag's eyes sparkled dangerously, a tight smile lifting his lips. He glanced back the way they had come, where smoke from soldiers' camps was clearly visible, and said, I always did like races. And now we are in one for our lives. Murtag swung into Tornak's saddle and trotted out of the camp. Aragon followed close behind in, on Snowfire. Saphira jumped into the air with the elf. She flew low to the ground to avoid being seen by the soldiers. In this fashion, the three of them made their way southeast toward the distant Hatterak Desert. Aragon kept a quick eye out for pursuers as he rode. His mind repeatedly wandered back to the elf. An elf? He had actually seen one. And she was with them. He wondered what Roran would think of that. It struck him that if he ever returned to Carvajal, he would have a hard time convincing anyone that his adventures had actually occurred. For the rest of the day, Aragon and Murtag sped through the land, ignoring discomfort and fatigue. They drove the horses as hard as they could without killing them. Sometimes they dismounted and ran on foot and gave Tornak and Snowfire a rest. Only twice did they stop both times to let the horses eat and drink. Though the soldiers of Gilead were far behind now, Aragon and Murtag found themselves having to avoid new soldiers every time they passed a town or village. Somehow the alarm had been sent ahead of them. Twice they were nearly ambushed along the trail, escaping only because Saphira happened to smell the men ahead of them. After the second incident, they avoided the trail entirely. Dusk softened the countryside as evening drew a black cloak across the sky. Through the night they traveled, relentlessly pacing out the miles. In the deepest hours of night, the ground rose beneath them, to form low, cactus-dotted hills. Murtag pointed forward. There's a town, Bullridge. Some leagues ahead that we must bypass. They're sure to have soldiers watching for us. We should try to slip past them now while it's dark. After three hours, they saw the straw-yellow lanterns of Bullridge. A web of soldiers patrolled between watchfires scattered around the town. Aragon and Murtag muffled their sword sheaths and carefully dismounted. They led the horses in a wide detour around Bullridge, listening attentively to avoid stumbling on an encampment. With the town behind them, Aragon relaxed slightly. Daybreak finally flooded the sky with a delicate blush and warm, chilly night air. They halted on the crest of a hill to observe their surroundings. The Rammer Rimmer was to their left, but there was also five miles to their right. The river continued south for several leagues, then doubled back on itself in a narrow loop before curving west. They had covered over 16 leagues in one day. Aragon leaned against Snowfire's neck, happy with the distance they had gone. Finally! Find a gully, or hollow, where we can sleep undisturbed. They stopped at a small stand of juniper trees and laid their blankets beneath them. Saphira waited patiently as they untied the elf from her belly. I'll take the first watch and wake you at mid-morning, said Murtag, setting his bare sword across his knees. Aragon mumbled his assent and pulled the blankets over his shoulders. Nightfall found them worn and drowsy, but determined to continue. As they prepared to leave, Saphira observed to Aragon, This is the third night since we rescued you from Gilead, and the elf still hasn't woken. I'm worried. And, she continued, she has neither drunk nor eaten in that time. I know little of elves, but she is slender, and I doubt she can survive much longer without nourishment. What's wrong? asked Murtag over Tornak's back. The elf, said Aragon, looking down at her. Saphira is troubled that she hasn't woken or eaten. 
It disturbs me too. I healed her wounds, at least on the surface, but it doesn't seem to have done her any good. Maybe the shade tampered with her mind, suggested Murtag. Then we have to help her. Murtag knelt by the elf. He examined her intently, then shook his head and stood. As far as I can tell, she's only sleeping. It seems as if I could wake her with a word or a touch, yet she slumbers on. Her coma might be something the elves self-induced to escape pain of injury. But if so, why doesn't she end it? There's no danger to her now. But does she know that? asked Aragorn quietly. Murtag put his hand on his shoulder. This must wait. We have to leave now or risk losing our hard-won lead. You can tend to her later when we stop. One thing first, said Aragorn. He soaked a rag and then squeezed the cloth so water dripped between the elf's sculpted lips. He did that several times and dabbed above her straight, angled eyebrows, feeling oddly protective. They headed down the hills, avoiding the tops for fear of being spotted by sentries. Saphira stayed with them on the ground for the same reason. Despite all her bulk, she was stealthy. Only her tail could be heard scraping over the ground, like a thick blue snake. Eventually, the sky brightened in the east. The morning star, Adel, appeared as they reached the edge of the steep bank covered with mounds of brush. Water roared below as it tore over boulders and sluiced through branches. The rammer, said Aragon over the noise. Murtag nodded. Yes, we have to find a place to ford safely. That isn't necessary, said Saphira. I can carry you across, no matter how wide the river is. Aragon looked up at her blue-gray form. What about the horses? We can't leave them behind. They're too heavy for you to lift. As long as you're not on them, and they don't struggle too much, I'm sure that I can carry them. If I can dodge arrows with three people on my back, I can certainly fly a horse in a straight line over a river. I believe you, but let's not attempt it unless we have to. It's too dangerous. She clambered down the embankment. We can't afford to squander time here. Aragon followed her, leading Snowfire. The bank came to an abrupt end at the rammer. The river ran dark and swift. White mist wafted up from the water, like blood steaming in winter. It was impossible to see the far side. Murtag tossed a branch into the torrent and watched it race away, bobbing through the rough water. How deep do you think it is? asked Aragon. I can't tell, said Murtag. Worry, coloring his voice. Can you see it far across it is with magic? I don't think so. Not without lighting this place up like a beacon. With a gust of air, Saphira took off and soared over the rammer. After a short time, she said, I'm on the other bank. The river is over a half mile wide. You couldn't have chosen a worse place to cross. The rammer bends at this point and is at its widest. A half a mile, exclaimed Aragon. He told Murtag about Saphira's offer to try to fly them. I'd rather not try it for the horse's sake. Tornak isn't as accustomed to Saphira as Snowfire. He might panic and injure them both. Ask Saphira to look for shallows where we can swim over safely. If there aren't any within a mile in either direction, then I suppose she can ferry us. At Aragon's request, Saphira agreed to search for a ford. While she explored, they hunkered next to the horses and ate dry bread. It was not long before Saphira returned, her velvet wings whispering in the early dawn sky. The water is both deep and strong, upstream as well as downstream. Once he was told, Murtag said, I'd better go over first, so I can watch the horses. He scrambled onto Saphira's saddle. Be careful, Tornak. I've had him for many years. I don't want anything to happen to him. Then Saphira took off. When she returned, the unconscious elf had been untied from her belly. Aragon led Tornak to Saphira, ignoring the horse's low whinnies. Saphira reared back on her haunches to grasp the horse around the belly with her forelegs. Aragon eyed her formidable claws and said, Wait. He repositions Tornak's saddle, blanket strapping, onto the horse's belly so it protected his soft underside, then gestured for Saphira to proceed. Tornak snorted in fright and tried to bolt when Saphira's forelegs clamped around his sides, but then she held him tightly. The horse rolled his eyes wildly, the whites rimming his dilated pupils. Aragon tried to gentle Tornak with his mind, but the horse's panic resisted his touch. Before Tornak could try to escape again, Saphira jumped skyward, her hind legs thrusting with such a force that her claws gouged the rocks underneath. Her wings strained furiously, struggling to lift the enormous load. For a moment, she seemed she would fall back to the ground. Then, with a lunge, she shot into the air. Tornak screamed in terror, kicking and tossing. It was a terrible sound, like screeching metal. Aragon swore, wondering if anyone was close enough to hear. He'd better hurry, Saphira. He listened for soldiers as he waited, scanning the inky landscape for the telltale flash of torches. It soon met his eye in the line of horsemen sliding down a bluff almost half a league away. As Saphira landed, Aragon brought Snowfire to her. Murtag's silly animal is in hysterics. 
He had to tie Tornak down to prevent him from running away. She gripped Snowfire and carried him off, ignoring the horse's trumpeted protestations. Aragon watched her go, feeling lonely in the, in the night. The horsemen were only a mile away. Finally, Saphira came back for him, and they were soon on firm ground once more, with the rammer rimmer to their backs. Once the horses were calmed, the saddles readjusted, they resumed their flight toward the Bayor Mountains. The air filled with the calls of birds waking to the new day. Aragon dozed even when walking. He was barely aware that Murtag was just as drowsy. There were times that neither of them guided the horses, and it was only Saphira's vigilance that kept them on course. Eventually, the ground became soft and gave way under their feet, forcing them to halt. The sun was high overhead. The Rammer River was no more than a fuzzy line behind them. They had reached the Hatterack Desert.